Corporation, uh, Mr. Alex Magro. And our panel today, the first one is Peter Dupont, who is a board member of CLASP and a co-chair of Asian Clean Energy Forum. The second one is Dr. Pantita Thanawatana and Dr. Sutilat Gittipong Vise from the Environmental uh, Research Institute of Jalalongkorn University. And the last one is Mr. Mark Hutchinson, who is a senior advisor from AW Lloyd. Watch you as you share with us. We might want to start off with, with some uh, initial reactions from, from each of you, if you thought about what you yeah. what you thought was conveyed, how well it was conveyed, or what not, vice versa. And we'll start off with you, Peter. Um, I'm sort of in awe. Uh, and what do you say after that? Um, it's just uh, overwhelming. Um, and I, I like the part about the movie. Uh, you can be overwhelmed, but you can take action. Um, I thought I would just spend like two or three minutes uh, sharing some facts. They mentioned the IPCC report, and it's really important. So I'll just put some things into perspective. And I, I had to spend some time myself to sort of get, uh, do a little bit of research today and yesterday on, on sort of the big picture. So they, they show this report being launched. Um, and so what does it mean in terms of the amount of, of CO2 and what we need to do to, to avoid this? Um, first of all, a couple, a couple of interesting facts. About half of the anthropogenic um, emissions of CO2 since 1750, since 1750, about half of the emissions have occurred in the last 40 years. Okay, so that's, my math's not very good, but that's 200. So, how, so that's the acceleration part that we saw, and they showed that very well with the uh, time lapse of the ice. Um, to reach, to stay within two degrees centigrade, which they um, talked about, we have to limit emissions to 450, or to limit concentrations to 450 ppm uh, by 2100. So to do that, Okay, how do we do that? Okay, that means by 2050, which is not that far away, we have to reduce emissions from what they are now by 40 to 70 percent. And uh, by 2100 to near zero. And, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other, you know, a, a few tidbits on different pieces of it, how much, where the emissions are coming from. And I won't bore you with those, but you know, it's me, I think, um, sharing some of those numbers is just to sort of underline what the film said. The film is obviously a lot more dramatic. <laughs> um, but just think about that. What, and and the other, one of the other things that really got to me, because um, my daughter will be 50, but the woman from World uh, WWF, her daughter will be 40 in the middle of the century, where we have to be um, you know, have reduced emissions by 40 to 70 percent. How do we do that? Not with that. I, I think it's a fantastic um, movie. Um, Alex, I don't know if you were uh, uh, selected this, uh, but it's, and I've got some other groups that I'm, I'm with that I'd, I'd like to show it to as well as a group of Democrats abroad. Uh, it's a fantastic movie. So thanks for inviting me. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, uh, it's available online, you, and you can very good copy online, so you can, you can get it there. And uh, they have laid down guidelines. Basically, anybody can use it on this nonprofit. So, so uh, and I agree with you. I, it, it helps to have a little color behind the numbers, and I think that's that's what we all sort of feel about. And whether or not you're you think that, uh, that global warming is, if you think that global warming is not really occurring. I think you have to look at these kind of images and the numbers, as you said, look at that one chart and and say, well, maybe there is some evidence that we ought to be concerned about. Um, thank you very much. Uh, John, how would you like to make your comment? Actually, um, my report is uh, more academic report, but uh, I think, firstly, uh, the movie says about the actions action of the people, like, like everyone has to take actions. But I think the movies, the lack of saying that who will take actions. I 
and what we will take actions, what kind of action we should take. It. So, in the last part of the movie, they're like talking about less much, but I don't think much is enough to solve the problems of climate change. Right? Daily activity, daily life of everyone in the world. Because they say that the activity of mining industry is a client of climate change. But I don't think just only industry sector, but all of us, all of us, regarding the research, how come agriculture sector also households. So for example, I come here by car. So I am a polluter. <laughs> right? So in the in the movie they didn't tell us what we should do, but they encourage us to think about climate change and the ethic of climate change. So what we have to talk or study to talk, because we are now here and form the academic center. Maybe we first have to introduce ourselves. Where are you from? Like NGO or um, industrial sector? Or where are you from? And what kind of activity you can change to help the world from the climate change? And one more point climate change and global warming are different. So we need to understand first what is the climate change and then we can have a change for our activities. So this is my report on the videos. It's not the end of the story. It's just uh, not yet starting. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, it's very true. This, this is meant obviously designed a year ago as a call to action. And there was, it culminated actually in two or three weeks after its release in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a march in, uh, I think it was in Washington, I'm not sure. New York. New York, New York. Sorry? New York. New York, okay. And, and do you remember how many people were there? It wasn't, a, they wanted a million, I think it was like five, six hundred thousand. So, you know, they could they turn out. But uh, yeah, that is definitely a call to action. And as they say there, you can go to 350.org, I think it's on there. It's, it's a good place to start and to, to get other links to see what type of actions can be taken, and uh, large and small, as, as you indicated. Uh, John, so did I come? Thank you very much for sharing this event to me. And to me, I also have the same feeling with Dr. Bajita. Uh, when I watch this video, it's no answer to me. So what are the solution in terms of mitigation or adaptation? I don't know what is the future or the direction of, uh, for this kind of. And for the second, I would like to know or I'd like to hear about the position or the laws of the rock and the rocking country in terms of climate change mitigation, what kinds of the activities and make one country can do, what kinds of activity not non and make one country can do in terms of voluntary basis or in terms of the commitment, especially in terms of the uh, net coming COP in Paris end of this year, right? We would like to know about the, um, the number or the target number in terms of the uh, GHG emission. Especially in Thailand, we would like to do something, but we, we don't know how in terms of the, how many percent we would like to achieve or something like that. And for the last one, anyway, I um, found the gap between the uh, relationship between the concentration of carbon dioxide and also the disaster. So, what is the direct relationship between greenhouse gas concentration and the national uh, disaster in our society? This is my point of view. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ajahn. I remember when when I was first made aware of, of the the uh, the issues. The the 
discussion in my circles was over whether we should focus on mitigation or adaptation. And, and I would say today, or it would appear anyway, again, I'm not a specialist in this, but I think the, the uh, mitigation thing, I think we need both, but adaptation ought to be primary on our list, in my own, my own personal opinion. Uh, mitigation is important, but we're going to have to live through it for sure. And I, don't, I think at one point we were hoping we wouldn't have to. But as they say very clearly here, it's going to happen. The, the effects are going to be upon us no matter what we do. And if we stop tomorrow, we're going to have some kind of follow-on effects. So thank you. Thank you very much, John. Mark? Yeah, hi. Wait, you got a little bell. <laughs> From Mark. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alex. Uh, you know, Peter's words are very, very useful to kind of set the scene. But, and, and given what Alex just said about mitigation, Buy a lot of pumps. You know that is. You know. You know. Sadly, you know. Sadly. Um. You know. I. I think. I think your point about you know the personal responsibility versus the I would say corporate policymaker regulatory politician kind of setting. And just in, in full disclosure, I, I I'm in the energy industry. I spent my whole life, which is probably why Alan's invited. I spent my whole life. In the energy sector, uh, I've advised governments on policy, uh, oil and gas companies, coal companies, power companies, on regulations, renewables, planning. And <clears throat> so I spent a lot of time kind of, but those are probably pictures of some of my clients. Um, you know, I, it, it all sounds very conspiratorial. And I don't. What I see when I when I, I did a policy project with the Malaysian government in 2013 to 2014, it was a year plus long project in the Prime Minister's department, and it was a very interesting. It was it was a very comprehensive one. Did, we did everything from transportation planning. We did a full energy balance for the whole country. Everything from energy imports, exports, trans, uh, transmission system, pipelines, transport. You know, uh, mass transit. Uh, you know, we did uh, economic impact by social sector. We we looked at cha subsidy changes by uh, household income levels. It was it was a very comprehensive study. And then, it, and, and one of the things that we, they one of the stated things they would hope to achieve was you know greater energy security. You know, not relying so much on fossil fuels. You know, a lot of the things that governments say going forward. And then I looked at all of the nice things that the government said. Uh, and we had lots of stakeholders. We had 50, at least 50 stakeholder meetings that went from uh, academics and NGOs all the way up to uh, the Federation of here, but anyway, the, the industry association. So we did the, the whole span. And you look at, at, at what Malaysia, if I look at Malaysia, Malaysia came down to really just simple economics. You know, they felt after all, you know, we put all this evidence in front of them, it just came down to we can't, we are an elected government, and we will not raise the price of whatever it was to improve significant, make a significant change in the way that we source energy or in the way that our people buy energy. And it was just that simple. And so when I, you know, when I look at all of these, by the way, when you see all that white stuff billowing out, that's water. That's condensation. That's not smoke. But it makes a beautiful picture. But, you know, so I don't look at this as quite as conspiratorial as I think the movie did. You know, let's face it, the oil and gas industry, the coal industry, just spent billions and billions of dollars in trying to influence the, the arguments. Um, you know, they're ultimately going to lose. And in fact, I don't know if you noticed, but Ten of the largest oil companies in the world, uh, X Chevron, uh, uh, Exxon, you know, the large oil companies in the U.S. A sign came out with a statement about a week or two ago, saying that they want to engage, acknowledging climate change, and saying they want to engage. Now, of course, we can look at cynically and say they're just trying to steer the, which of course they're trying to steer. What are you talking about? But you know, the point of it is. Um, 
they can, they've actually acknowledged it, so it's actually a step forward. And now, once you get them into the process, it's going to be easier to change it than on the line than the outside. At the same time, if you actually try to get the people on the street to try to push aside things up, you know, I'm, I, I was born in the U.S., went through our civic systems, and I'm an, uh, I have a master's in public policy, and I'm, I'm a very firm believer in the participatory democracy and the need for all the different segments in society to push their own agendas. Okay? And that includes going all the way down to kind of the grassroots, the way that, that this is being done here. I have made the decision, personal decision in my life, to kind of work within the system a little bit and push for changes there. Um, when I, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going on a little bit long. When I, when I left the United States uh, in 1994 to move here, I just spent five years at a, at a power utility, and we spent $100 million a year on energy efficiency programs. And what we did is, is my, my degree is in uh, energy environmental policy. And we made a deal with the government, the regulator, we made about $10 million a year if we spent $100 million a year. That sounds good to me. Um, because we weren't going to be able to build more power plants. So, so the deal, we made the deal to compensate us. But we spent $100 million a year. And I remember the old, when I first moved to Asia in 1994, the discussions I had with governments was, you know, efficiency was way up. You know, we didn't really need to talk about it in policy. When you're doing all your models and plans, you didn't really need to think about it. Thailand was a little bit ahead. But now when I do it, it's just a given. The whole policy and planning process within these governments and even within the corporations is this is just a given that you can you can change the trajectory, right, by demand side management, energy pricing, efficiency standards. And all of these things, and now it's just a given. So it's been a real big change, which is a positive thing. Um, but there's a lot more to go. Okay, hey, thank, thank you, Mark. I, uh, I'm kind of surprised. I, I frankly didn't see the conspiratorial element in there so much. I, I just thought maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, so this is what's happening. And, yeah. um, but okay, I'll. Uh, I think we will open up the floor if anybody in the audience has questions first, and if, if not, then I'll, I'll, I'll solve the, the, the demonstration a little bit. Anybody have questions? No, you're using one. Thank you. I'm Robert Kinnear. Alternative Innovations, some of you guys know I'm a conceptual designer. Um, it's not really a question, but uh, if you don't mind me, of expanding just for a short moment. There, there is a time limit, Robert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But some, <laughs> well, don't we know? <laughs> um, I, I am an engineer, a water engineer, a civil engineer. I was also in the uh, oil and gas business, designing oil wells. I was a general manager of an oil company. I work in disaster and emergency relief uh, on the alternative side of things. And uh, I'm very much sustainable alternative ways of doing business. But because of my awful background, some while ago, if anyone cares to look at my Facebook, I can't remember all of the numbers, but I did a quick calculation regarding uh, climate change. That if you look at the geological time that went in the movie, the time of to all this black stuff down there that had been, been made by the sun, we're talking about oil and gas and uh, coal, uh, 60 million years and earlier than that ago, and uh, you're talking about this uh, sudden change in climate in the last 40, 50 years. Well, it's only been, I, I used 100 years as uh, industrial revolution. If you compare 100 years to the, this energy that's been stored 60 million years more ago, this is not even a nanosecond of a nanosecond in geological time. All this energy, I mean, you don't have to be a scientist, really, just, just broad brush strokes down here. All that energy of 60 million years ago is suddenly being released in this nanosecond. Now, I know we're in Asia here, so, but <laughs> I'm sure most of us have been in Europe where you need to turn on heating. When you turn on the heating, the room warms up. Well, what you've done is by burning, I did, again, I did all these calculations, uh, again. by burning all these billions of oil 
barrels of oil or, or uh, this energy. It turns out that, I can't remember the number, it's like 1 to the uh, exponential 27 or something kilowatts of energy has been burned in this period of time in 100 years. And when you turn on the fire to warm or your central heating to, to warm your room, this is what's happened. We've just unleashed this vast amount of energy into the atmosphere in a nanosecond of time. It's a nice comparison and, uh, and uh, I think a very effective one. Any, any comments from the panel? Um, I, um, John, you raised a good point. The movie doesn't tell us what to do. Um, and I think the movie, I didn't realize that while I was watching it because I sort of know what these people are. Um, and I think that's a valid criticism. I think the movie would be more powerful if they had like that chart um, that shows the CO2 when it goes way up. Um, and they gave a few numbers making it clear that we're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> um, because it wasn't, it, but I, I, if you flip it around and say, what can we do? Um, I think the movie is, is really powerful because the whole point of the movie is that we can't get to um, Success. What, what does success look like? Success looks like limiting it to 450 or maybe 550. Maybe it's three degrees or four degrees. And there's no way. We can. But success um, will only happen by mass mobilization. I'll give a couple of examples. Um, uh, you know, we can use plastic. Or we can use cloth packs, which I do, and use less plastic. We can turn the air conditioner off. Um, in uh, you know in the room when we leave the room or turn the lights off, but this, there's fundamental uh, you know systemic um, things that need to be done in the realm of policy and regulation, and they're not happening because you know Mark referred to some of them. But the you know the very interesting article in today's um, Bangkok Post, which is my uh, paper of choice, because I live in Bangkok. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim Young, Kim, Kim, and Christine Lagarde, who are the head of the World Bank and the IFC, calling for a carbon, uh, a carbon pricing. Um, this is the sort of thing that needs to happen because, you know, I, I listed a few things. What do I have to be positive about? Well, we're going to reach grid parity. In case you don't know what that means, probably most of you do, but the price of solar and batteries in a house will be no more than traditional um, fossil fuel power within two to three years. Okay, that means you actually could get by you know, technically without any fossil fuels, you know, maybe four or five years before it really works commercially. That's something we have to do. 50% um, of new capacity globally is, renewed, is installed this year with renewable energy. I'm happy about that. Okay, that's not that's just the capacity, right? The energy is still only about 25%. Um, and there's all these co-benefits, but you know the reason um, you know that Malaysia might act more quickly on your plan is energy security. It's not climate change because there isn't a price. So um, you know, I, I I do think fundamentally that it's you know that the U.S. is probably the, the most difficult country now because you have uh, more than half of the Congress doesn't actually believe the science is settled. Right? So how, you know, in a case like that, how do you try to change the policy? So I love this movie because it makes me want to go out and march. Good. That's just exactly what it's meant to do. So uh, I'll go ask the panel what Mark, Mark would like to comment first. I'm an, econ <clears throat> I'm an economist by training, so the carbon tax to me is the only way. You know, we, you know, I, I just been building my retirement. Uh, by, by the way, we did not coordinate yeah, sure. <laughs> um, My clients are not oil and gas. Companies. <laughs> they like the uh, You know, I, I try to live as, as, as you know, environmentally friendly. I've been my retirement home, which I just finished, is a net zero house. I put a 3.5 kb uh, uh, PB panel on the top, and it will use zero net energy. Okay. The walls are this thick, it's triple, and it's really cold right 
this triple pane glass super efficient. Okay? I try to live that. But honestly, I don't really think that most of us will. Unless there's some pain in our wallet or our purse, our bank accounts. And that is where your carbon tax needs to come in. And unless the carbon tax comes in at a, at a painful level, because it won't significantly change your behavior. I mean, what I usually say in, in, in a lot of these energy conferences, raise your hands. How many of you, and I know I'm talking to the preaching to the choir, how many of you would be willing, drop your hands if you would not be willing to pay 10% more to have 50% of your energy renewable, like from your electric meter? 20%, would you be willing to pay 20% more? And I'll tell you, when I'm at these conferences, the hands are going down, <laughs> down. And if I get to 50, there's one person at the back. And this is the thing, you know, you, you check with your, you know, maybe your nine believer friends, check with them. Check on that. Make a point in terms of uh, the distribution of the costs. In terms of developed country versus developing countries. So you're saying developing countries don't develop. Oh, trust me, I you know I've been in 58 countries, 59. Sorry, um, I have seen a lot of this. To me, I have I have a lot of sympathy for countries like India, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, Laos, uh, when they look at the developed world and say. You're responsible for most of that you want us to stop? Seriously. Um, let us contribute on a per capita basis what you contributed. You know, how do you, how do you stop that? So I'm really, you know, I'm conflicted on that. Because, you know, I see, uh, like in India, they're doing a huge amount of coal plants. But you look around at the energy poverty that's there and then just the basic dignity of people that they can't even get, they can't afford the refrigeration, their food is rotting. You know, just, really simple, basic stuff. So I, I struggle with that. Coal, let's be very clear, is the cheapest source of electrical energy, except maybe hydropower, and that has all of its other issues. So what do you do? And I, and I struggle with that one all the time. OK, fine. We had, uh, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, yes, so I, also, I, I also work in the energy industry, but the green energy industry. So our company, we have operated uh, for eight years. We have co-financed pro 371 projects that have created cumulatively about 35 million tons of emission reductions. Right? I'm also very engaged in the international kind of policy scene. Um, the, the, the Paris and what I would like to say is that um, I think that there has been a paradigm shift which requires us to actually reframe the way we discuss and it's related to this parity, it's related to innovation. And it's related to the co-benefits of these new technologies that are bottom-up technologies, right? Which, by large and everywhere, do not happen, uh, not because they don't exist, because they do, but because there are incumbents that have the power, right? When you talk about lowest cost for fossil, you should say that Fossil fuels receive about 590 billion US dollars of subsidies, right? That means, and you talk about the cost of fossil, that's not the true cost, right? So, you know, like, let's remove subsidies first, right? Let's put the subsidies, for example, into renewables, you know, like, if that had happened for a while, you know, like, the story would be different. If you look at how incumbents control regulation uh, everywhere, right? It's that what's holding us back, not the fact that it's not existing. Let's come back from California, um, where distributed energy, which is basically a combination of solar, homes, batteries, and electric cars, is now really taking off, right? What's holding back the industry is the way that electricity is regulated by utilities, uh, you know, and, and it's slowly changing. The moment that regulation is gone, the whole system switches, right? I also went to the spring meetings of the World Bank uh, in April, right? There was a panel. President of the World Bank was the CEO of Citibank, with the CEO of a pension fund, a Nordic pension fund, um, very big. And basically, the discussion was not anymore about um, you know, how do we promote renewable energy. The discussion was about how can we reallocate capital from the fossil industry in, uh, uh, into the renewable energy fast enough to avoid a breakdown of the financial system. Because the worry is 
that the fossil assets that are existing depreciate so fast, right, that people with money in that industry are basically losing it, their stranded assets, right, which is a huge problem for pensioners in Europe because that's where the money is, right. So that's like, how do we create a soft landing for these utilities? If you look at uh, European utilities, there was $1.5 trillion in valuation over the last couple of years. You have like new CEOs of electric utilities that say, you know, uh, we blocked renewables way too long in our own business model and now we are paying the price, right? They can't switch fast enough, right? You know, and, and to get into, into these new business models, right? How is that informing, you know, action, for example, in Thailand, right? When we talk about Paris, you know, when we talk about like really, we're not talking about burden sharing anymore. That was Kyoto, right? It was like there was a high price, there was a cost to be paid, you know, and the, when it comes to paying the bill, nobody wants to pay. These days are over. This is now about opportunity sharing, right? It's not, you know, like, it's not about reductions. It's about how aggressive can you be to position your country in this new economy uh, to, to be competitive, right? You know, like, so it's, you know, it's, it's looking on the benefit side of what you can do, not on the cost side, right? That is, I think that is completely the wrong perspective. My company, we are very active also in advisory, policy advisory, including Thailand, like right now for a program on low carbon cities, right? Which I actually very much like because, you know, we have to talk about it in a bottom up way. Right, in terms of action is always coming up, right? And it's about it's exactly about these opportunities. It's about local employment, it's like locally generated electricity, local jobs, the local use of resources, you know, like circular economy models. It's that what we have to embrace. And it's, it's I, I see it as a huge opportunity, right? And a complete game changer. For me the question is how can we design policy, policies that are conducive to this change? To accelerate, you know, but it's about opportunity. Um, it's a great space for startups because it's all bottom up. It's a great space for innovators, right? Um, there's huge opportunity on the finance side, you know, like banks need to think differently about um, how they work, right? It's like it's kind of like energy is being disrupted in a way that telecoms was disrupted when it went basically internet, right? And it created players, just for analogy, right? that nobody heard of, you know, like all the telephone companies, you know, uh, it's a new chance and nobody owns the space, right? So, you know, like for example, like even here, like for a utility, a big utility like that, Bigger or so, they need to completely rethink. Instead of thinking coal power and Krabi, right, they should be thinking distributed energy kind of like everywhere, right? If they're not doing it, History will punish them. I mean, and everyone who keeps in that old thing. Okay, I think that, that opens up a, a, an interesting perspective right there, too, with the opportunities that are there. And, and your company is certainly massive. I'm sorry. Maybe you want to tell the panelists your, your company. I mean, I don't uh, the the company is called South Pole Group. We are like a social enterprise from Switzerland, but we are like 15 countries, including the big office here. I, don't, I could be wrong, but you don't have much competition here, do you? We used to, <laughs> but in the current <laughs> Okay, interesting. Yeah, there, there are business opportunities, and I guess the, that's a good way to approach the problem is to say it's not a problem, it's a challenge. And, and with that challenge comes opportunities. Uh, very interesting. Uh, did uh, anybody else have any thoughts on what they'd like to share? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, so this was my take. I actually follow the movie tell us what we need to do. Now, I didn't go through a list of, you know, do not use uh, plastic bags or plastic bottles, but it did say basically that the only way to change this is to, is to join grassroots movements. Basically, we all have individual responsibility to do something. So governments just, you know, it's a balance of power. The oil industry, and we're picking on the oil industry, but I mean, there are many other industries, but it was mentioned agriculture, absolutely. Um, they have vested interests and they know where they lie, and so do we, except we don't care about them most of the time, I don't get that, and then we expect that somebody else is gonna take care of the problem, it's not gonna happen. I thought it was hypocritical. I felt for a man that's crying at the UN saying that the super typhoon in, in the Philippines was terrible. I cannot even imagine, so obviously I'm not uh, 
you know, belittling him in any way. But you would imagine after five years, maybe the Philippines was on par to become the greenest country in the world. But I assure you, that's probably not the case. So we can cry all day long, but unless we're willing to make changes, you know, in our daily lives, then you know, nothing's going to happen because the fact is, these companies are spending real money, you know, affecting governments. So that's why it matters when they see big, you know, groups of people marching. You know, maybe it's a symbolic thing, but that's what it takes. That point, the, the Philippines has, had, has instituted a very significant solar program in the last few years. So, uh, and there's a big deadline coming in March, and there's a huge amount of activity going on. And we'll be revising some of those projects as well. So, they have done something, but you're probably right. It's still not enough. And I'm not picking on the Philippines. We have a tsunami here. I mean, things happen all over the place. But that was an example. Yes, indeed. Wait. Um, my name is Alex, and I work in the agricultural industry um, directly with uh, farms as well as processing um, for export price. And we also have uh, energy assets in Thailand, biomass. Um, and I actually work on some projects for Hingo as well um, um, that are more sustainability focused, um, whether it be organic farms or um, uh, try to recycle foods that are for garbage dumps and whatnot. All very, very grassroots type of things. Um, my concern is that I come from a corporate background as well. And when I attend panels, um, such as oil and gas industry, not keeping on it, the executive would say, well, climate change is actually good for us. I was telling Nick this earlier tonight. If it's too hot, you're going to turn on the air conditioning. If it's too cold, you're going to turn on the heat. So why the hell are we going to change our business? Same thing with agriculture. So you have a drought, okay, buy a GMC. You have a flood, okay, buy a GMC, buy more fertilizers. You're gonna buy more equipment from the industry that are indeed the income employers. And they're the ones who are giving billions and trillions of dollars to the government to fund the whole entire current system. So I know Ingo attends a lot of great innovative type of programs. I don't, I see the results on the ground. I see what people are buying at the farms. I see what people are doing at the farms. We're sitting in a room that's chilled to 23 degrees Celsius. I need a jacket in there. Where is the political motivation? I would like to ask the panelists. Fair enough.
if this video are open for the you know, the stage politicians, I don't think something changed. But I didn't talk to to say about hopeless, but I don't think I can change anyone, only myself. So I'm just starting to ask him what I have to do after. So the 
uh, IPCC said, okay, to, to reach this two degrees, uh, this 450, how much do we have to spend? So remember, 1.2 trillion or 1,200 billion. Um, they have to spend 650 billion dollars a year more on energy efficiency, and uh, you have to you know spend about 350 billion dollars a year less on extraction of minerals, obviously. Um, this is the scale of it. And then what you, Alex, you raised the point about access, right? Well, you only have to spend about 70 to 90 billion dollars a year to get uh, access for the 1.3 billion people who don't have access and the 3 billion people who have uh, solid fuels, um, you know, for clean cook. So that's totally manageable. You know, the numbers are manageable, but going back to what um, Mark said, I just, you know, I, I don't think it's going to happen without pricing. If it, or it will happen 20 years too late. I just don't think it's going to happen. You know, it's it will start happening because the, the, the price effects and reaching great parity and things like that. But you still have to have the price signal. I agree, and I, I like Mark's uh, sort of independent self-proof of that. I'll do it after I want to, but most people, or a lot of people, will not. I, I, I agree. Uh, Robert, you had something to. Uh, yes, thanks very much. Um, I think I've got a, unfortunately, a message of, or a, a view of total despair. Um, and I'm not joking, really, really. We, we know you, Robert. Like every message is total despair. <laughs> no, no, you, you, you haven't a clue. What, no, you, you haven't a clue. The, the, we're, we're talking about global warming here, and uh, we, we, we look at the, the, the sphere. Uh, we're talking about political stuff here. We're, we, we have, we've got to look at the, the global uh, political economic sphere as well. And I think there's three major regions within that, within the sphere. <coughs> that is one group that we're, we're all part of, that, uh, you know, that, let's call it the developed world. And uh, we, we realize there's a problem and we need something to do about it. Then you've got the people who might the middle of Saudi, just take Saudi as the main player here. You know, they're the ones that drop the price of oil to get uh, market share. There's no question, they're not even considering anything about climate change here. They're talking about market share. This is, this is business they're talking about, nothing to do with the environment. And then you look at America and their whole, and why did they drop the price of oil? Well, America was going to suddenly get a whole bunch of shale gas. <coughs> Uh, when the price was up, and so that was going to threaten the, uh, the market share of Saudi. So what do they do? They collapse the price, and suddenly shale gas goes out the bloody window. Right? This part of me. Um, so shale gas around the world has suddenly collapsed. Then you've got another group, which is half of the world's population, which does not have oil and gas uh, resources, but they do. I get four or five magazines connected to the oil and gas industry every month, and I, it spreads. The oil and gas business is global. So I get a full report from five different angles, from the Society of Petroleum Engineer magazine to a range of others, Ex exploration production, world oil, uh, offshore engineer, oil and gas production, there are some of the titles. And they give you a, a detailed account of what's going on. Anybody can get this information. It's not, I'm not privy to it as a sole, you know, there's lots of people reading the magazines. Africa is full of oil and gas. Sudan, you've heard about, why is, why is there North and South Sudan just now? Um, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, PTT just bought a whole bunch of gas, remember? Thai people, about how they got a huge supply of gas uh, off uh, uh, from Tanzania, which is as big as the resources of, of Qatar. Uh, so enough, and why, why are they talking, you know, that's it's just across the water, so they can plug in into, into the pipeline uh, on the west coast of, uh, of Thailand and put it into, into the power stations. There's huge amounts of oil and gas. Shell are going into deep water in, in uh, Burma now that that's all changed. There's, there's, and coal, there's enough coal for 300 years. India, China, they're all digging it. They're all wanting. This, all this, this half the world's population, as was mentioned there, are wanting what we've got. And they're going to get it. 
there, there's no political clout there to try and make them, prevent them from getting it. They're all wanting cars and highways and fridges and TVs and iPhones and all the rest of it. And they're going to get it. You look at any African state, for example, or South American state, how democratic are they? They're all after oil and gas and a better lifestyle. So that exponential curve that we've got there, that's up until now. Wait, <laughs> wait for the next 20, 30 years and see how it, it, it's going to go exponential. If it could fall over on itself, it would do. It's going to go truly vertical exponentially with my despair story. I, I, I think you're exactly right uh, that, that, that looking at current trends, but I would also say there's an argument, you see what's happening in China, where they're being very quick to wreck the world, relatively quick to see the ramifications, and, and they're trying to adjust, and I think that might be the model, you know, wishful thinking perhaps, that, that other countries will look to, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, say, you know, we can't go quite as far as we'd like to, because even the Chinese couldn't do it, and they've had to make it. I mean, it's just a, for the sake of, of, of making ourselves feel better, I think, maybe a little bit. But we had a comment over here. Well, yeah. Um, hang on to that. The way I look at this is, if you're honest with yourself, uh, it, it is a matter of desperation. Things are really, really bad. So much uh, is locked in with the amount of uh, CO2 that will be in the air for the next 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, and we're not turning things off, that change that's coming is, is, is already very, very bad at the point across. So to me, for, for myself, um, I basically have to be dishonest with myself and say, I pretend that that's not going to happen and try to work at the highest level that I can to impact change to push us in a better direction. But uh, when I look at society in general, you need to shake them out of the doldrums and, and get them going in the same direction, but not put them in a panic where they don't do anything. That's where the, that's where the real problem is, is that it's really hard to, to shake people out of, out of the doldrums and not get them to just say, uh, well, we're already screwed. So what do you guys suggest there? What, what do you do? I'm a writer and a consultant and, and focus in this area. So. Very, very good question. Would anybody like to <laughs> the path to salvation? Yeah, I think back to the video, this is called the communications of the risk or what we call risk communications. Um, one of the good models is that if we make a good information, but we didn't leave the way out for the people to get information that more dangerous. So the, in the video talking about the facts, the data, the information, the treatments. So this three message should go to the direct persons. Direct person here is means all stakeholder, policy maker, like government industrial sector, agricultural sector, students, or like universities. And so that's kind of communication, so change the actions. As you ask him what is his actions, he can answer based on his um, understanding, because uh, not too much information we get about the climate change, based on our research, when we go to the local communities, they not even know what is the climate change. They not even know what is the difference between global warming and the climate change. And they don't know what kind of their actions will be affected to climate change. So that, that kind of, the, of the information out of that they need to know and to communicate. So uh, we better study from the root of the problems. I got it. Gotcha. Ingo, we've got, we're just down to the last couple of minutes. I'm going to let everybody here make a, a final one. Oh, okay. Very quickly. Uh, very quickly. So I, I'm right. I, I like, what the hell can I do? So I'm writing a book on my spare time. It's called Ageless Clean Energy Heroes. 
connecting the dots of a there's more energy future than <laughs> No, it's actually, no, no, I've got this all planned out. We've been doing 20 a year. Um, uh, connecting the dots of an energy future that just might work. And so my idea is that there are people out there already who have the key to business models, as Ingo was saying. Ingo is probably one of them. If you want to be in my book? Um, uh, no, just, be, just to keep hope, because there are people out there, and those people are the forerunners of, of what a lot of other people need to follow on. Thank you. Very good. Can you go quickly? Because I'm going to ask you that. This is a great chance to tell my favorite anecdote. Um, so, 1890, there was a conference in London. It was a huge crisis, a city crisis, because cities were about to drown in horseshoes because there were like so many horses, because that was a transport solution at the time. And they met again in 1891, uh, but they couldn't agree you know, like how to solve it. Come 1910, the problem was solved, because there was now a thing called the car. And it was, it was invented not to solve the horse ship crisis, you know, but it was invented because it was actually convenient. Right? I think when we talk about solutions here, right, uh, it's the same. These low carbon lifestyles have to be sexy, they have to be more convenient. When I was in California, I, I drove a Tesla S in insane mode. And it is really, it's like sitting in a fighter jet that takes up from a carrier, from an airplane carrier. Because, like, really press. And that is cool, right? And that is what Elon Musk is doing, right? So, kind of like, like electric cars now become a thing. It's not, oh, you know, it's like, yeah, we have to be responsible. You know, bicycles in Europe, right? People got out of the cars. Millennials don't want to own cars anymore. You know, like, not everybody has a cool bike, right? And it's like, there's integrated transport solutions, and now we're going to have electric cars, and then they're going to be self driving, and they're going to be made by Apple, you know, like, prices, you know. That's not going to On food and agriculture, it's going to be the same, right? It's going to be like this new foods and so we have to appear that we have to you know like aspire you know and the products that we're talking about have to have to aspire they cannot be born out of this notion we have to do something it's like no we want to use them because they're better for us right very very good comment a lot of times you the original intent of the new process or new product is goes by the way at the wayside and you actually do something else with it but I was reminded of a great quote from Henry Ford. He said, if, uh, if I actually built what people were looking for, I would have built a faster horse. <laughs> and and, and you know, again, not, he wasn't directly responding to what they thought they needed. He was coming up with a, a solution to the overall issue. So we'll take just a, a few quick minutes and ask for a final closing comment from each of our panelists. This time we'll begin uh, with the other side of the part. I, I, I agree. I don't know if those of you who remember an American political history in the late 70s during the first oil crisis, there was a Jimmy Carter was president then, sat in the Oval Office, did a news conference, he was wearing sweaters because he turned the temperature down and the light, and he had a reading lamp next to his, his chair and, the, and all the lights in the room were dim. And that, that was called freezing in the dark solution. That doesn't work. Okay. My house in Maine, in Maine the, one I, the one I mentioned earlier, it will be hell of a lot more comfortable because you won't get drafts from the, you know, the, 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 the walls won't feel cold, the windows won't feel cold. I've got very small heat pumps that can keep the whole house. It'll be a much more comfortable house. My beautiful big picture windows looking out of the woods, but they're triple pane. So it's beautiful, it's efficient, and it's comfortable. You've got to have solutions that are going to make people happy because otherwise it won't really work. And new business models, I think I agree. You, know, you look at what's happening with solar. I, I still think that the battery solution is still a ways away. The PVs themselves, solar panels, are almost greater. And that's that's now. Uh, batteries are a bit more. But I, I'm worried about this uh, because solar panels impose a, a Germany has this problem. A huge amount of pan uh, PV that they've got in there has just screwed up their grid. Yeah, because it's in you know, the the sun and the wind don't always cooperate, and then the way that the the power plants were all built, the big ones, and then the transmission.
transmission systems which feed it had to be completely re-engineered. Actually, EGAS is doing the same thing here right now because the amount of uh, PV capacity that's coming in here is actually switching flows on the transmission system. So it's kind of messing it up, and they're spending a huge amount of money reinforcing the transmission system. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, I need to come back to that later. Um, I think that's the right train of thought. Uh, but, but oh yeah, sorry. What I, what I'm afraid of is that you you throw out the old regulation because you're still going to be relying on these central grids, even though you're going to have all this dispersed generation of people's grids off commercial generation. You're going to still rely on the central grid to balance it all. Okay, that's where you need to mix the new regulation with the old. Okay, and of course it's where you get and PA and MEA eight fight with these things. But you've got to balance that because otherwise the whole thing becomes very close to collapse and it's extremely expensive. So, uh, new business models, yes. Okay, but that that sort of introduces a, a whole new topic, and we're trying to wrap it up here. We will. Can you hold up and go, please? We'll ask them to continue with their observations. Yeah. So, it can to get about one minute for wrap up. So, maybe yes. your turn. Uh, according to our conversation, it can summarize the key difficulties in uh, for climate change mitigation. The first is about the perception of the people, especially lay people, they don't know the problems of climate change. According to my PhD result, I found that Thai people, they believe in faith, fatalism, right? They told me that they will die anyway, so they do not think, nothing they don't want to do, something like that. This is the key result that I got. And for the second, it's about the difficulties in the policy in terms of the regulation. I think it's in my country still on the way and going. The policy that they, they have to think about the uh, career, make it clear. And the third one is about everyone mentioned about the financial scheme in terms of the carbon tax, energy pricing, in terms of the money government have to provide and also let the uh, local authority to know the way to use the money. And the last one, I would like to give one keyword about the monthly stakeholders. Because in terms of climate change, there is no simple solution. Everyone has to take care of our own. This is my conclusion. Thank you. Yes, I totally support Dr. Sotiras. As I told everyone that we cannot change policy. We cannot change everyone. And we cannot change the situations. It's getting worse. But what we can do is that we do our best for ourselves. I mean, we we don't have to say you have to do this, you have to do this. But just like we start to change from our activities, I still keep um, believe that small change are powerful than any change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Finally. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think, um, I was just thinking about, is it fair to say that uh, financial innovation and business models will solve the problem if we can just sit back and watch it happen? I mean, I guess in your, you're talking about, you go, the consumers are the ones who are actually going to be driving it moving towards these technologies. But I, you know, going back to the movie, I, I think, um, you know, I really think it's people need to get fired up. And just look at the U.S. People need to get fired up. Uh, and that, so that's one bottom-up thing that needs to happen. Because we're not going to even be a deficit support for carbon pricing without people getting riled up. On the other hand, you can do a lot with business and investment. And I'll just give a quick example. Uh, you know, without government regulation, nuclear power. Okay, nuclear renaissance is going to save us from climate change. That's what people were saying ten years ago. And you know, I used to be personally opposed to nuclear because of uh, safety issues and waste issues. I used to say, yeah, you know, it's there's no real safe way to dispose of it. Well, events have gone 
you know, superseded all of, of these concerns. Not that they, there are concerns, but nuclear power is not having a renaissance because of the money. A, the plants are too expensive to build. B, no one is going to insure them. C, utilities won't take the risk. This leads to my final point, which I meant to make earlier and I didn't. Um, on the financial side, I see the insurance and risk industries as playing a key role um, in uh, uh, getting utilities, you know, utilities have risk officers and they're, you know, sort of saying, look, you've got to mobilize into the renewable energies. I mean, there's a very interesting way you put that, that discussion sounds very interesting. So, you know, I think from a risk perspective, there, there's 400, today there's 400 corporations and multinational corporations that now have carbon pricing. And I read recently that Microsoft has carbon pricing and they actually put it on their books, you know, in the profit and loss of the individual divisions. Now that is cool. Now, a lot of people think that's nerdy, but that's, that's very cool. Um, and that's the type of cool in the same way that the Tesla is cool that will sort of move things along that doesn't obviate the need for us to get out on the street and, you know, uh, in, in my view, follow the dictates of the movie. Not at all. I think the movie is was very inspiring. I think we, we all agree that it gave us a lot of food for thought and, and some motivation. I know there's a couple of other people here who would like to continue the discussion. We can do that, but for now we'll, we will let the panelists go for uh, their own relaxation. Thank you very much. Have a big hand for a panel.